Building any data pipeline, at least analytically speaking, generally starts with an extract. It doesn't matter if you're doing ETL or ELT, we always have to somehow get data out of a data source. Now, if you recall, I've recently started a series again where we're doing a back to the basics. So we're really starting from the fundamentals of what you will do as a data engineer. In the last video that I did, we talked about kind of SQL and what happens when you click run on your SQL query. And in this video, we're gonna talk about the basics of extract. And in particular, we're gonna be talking about an API and how you pull data from an API because it honestly gets pretty complicated. It's why there are so many companies totally focused just on extract. And even some of those companies only have a few hundred connectors unless you're portable, which has 1500. So today we're gonna deep dive into how to extract data from an API and the various challenges you'll run into, as well as the variations of setups that people have when you are interacting with APIs, because they don't all act the same. They're all different. And there's a lot of different places that they can change, which is one of the reasons it can be difficult to create a generalized API data connector. So with that, let's dive in. So let's start by just discussing what an API is, and I'll give a quick analogy here in a second. But really an API or an application programming interface is really just something that acts like a bridge between two pieces of software so that two systems can talk to each other. One way you can think about this, uh, we're gonna go to a restaurant a analogy here. The customer can essentially act like the client, the person on the side, that's about to interact with the API. Uh, the menu could almost act like your API documentation, right? It gives you the options of what you can actually do with said API. The waiter, in this case, is the API, right? Is the one, the one that's going to interact with you and the back of the house, the cooks, everyone else back there, which is generally a server or the thing that's actually hosting the API or the other part of the software that's essentially being interacted with. And in our case, a lot of the times, this is some level of database. So you've got an API that can then take your order so this is generally when you pass in the params. So what are the things that you actually want? You're going to pass in the specific, maybe, oh, give me all the customers in your database request, which is obviously a very strange thing to order for lunch. And you're going to have maybe a few alterations such as, and this is the actual params before it was really just the API call. So the API call uh, and then the params, which would be something like, hey, I only want to get customers from this date to this date. Or maybe I only want to get a specific customer based on my ID. And then you start giving it those more specific pieces of information so that I can go back uh, to the back end, to the back of the house and get you the exact data that you need and then come forward and give you it back once uh, the back end has prepared it or the back of the house. And you do not need to know what is going on in the back of the house. You just know at the end of the day, you got your data. It's the correct data and you can go on with your life. Now for this example, we're gonna be going over this little bit of code. It's an open API that you can use, you can access for free. And we're going to essentially use it to talk through the various components. It doesn't have everything you need, but we're gonna talk through some of the components such as authentication, pagination, parsing your data, and the various challenges you'd run into when interacting with an API, especially as a data engineer. All right, so I'm gonna use this script as an example. Again, it's a very basic API call. Um, they don't have authentication or pagination, but we'll talk about that and the various uh, ways you can deal with that and give you a breakdown of those methods. But we can kind of look at the baseline of this call here. So what you will see to start is I have hard coded a few things. So if you were to build this, you probably would build a more generalized script, but this is just to make things very clear. So one, as you're going through the API, you have to have those endpoints, which all that really means is a URL that interacts with some snippet of code. Usually it's something like get customer or maybe just very clearly customer in the URL. We'll give a few examples here of various APIs. You might have some parameters to provide it. So in here we have start and end time and it's important to call this out, but this is a REST API. And that's just one of these several options uh, that you have in terms of APIs. And I'm sure plenty of people who have been around a little longer are also very familiar with things like SOAP, which is another paradigm in terms of APIs. And again, there's plenty of ways that you can interact uh, with systems to pull out data. Generally, you will likely write either a get or a post request. So these are different methods uh, you can use when you interact with this type of an API. One of them, uh, kind of as the name suggests, is a get. So you are generally pulling data back. What you'll see is what I'm using here. You can see the response uh, request.get URL. In comparison, post tends to be more for forms or when you're actually pushing data uh, into a system when you're trying to post it there. Although sometimes I have had to use it, uh, I think often if I recall, it's generally for when I've had to pull data via a report. Um, so maybe you have to fill out a form to get re a report back instead of just pulling back data. Now, once you've got that data pulled or at least returned and everything's returned normally, which you know you can see here, there's a status code and generally uh, specifically with this type of API, you'd have different status codes, which we can put up. This is very familiar to anyone who's you know not been able to find a page on the internet 
kind of similar, but there's a bunch of status codes in terms of like 200, 500, and 400s that are generally the most common you'll run into. 200 means things are good. 400 generally means that you've done something wrong or something about your uh, formation of either the syntax or maybe again, there's a page that doesn't exist and it's something on your side that you need to fix. And 500 suggests that there's something wrong with the server. But assuming that goes well, now you go into parsing. And I'm going to quickly talk about parsing before we get into pagination and authentication. But parsing is just that step that you're going to need to take that most of the time when you do this data or when you do this uh, request, what is returned is JSON. And I say most of the time because there's definitely a ton of other things that could come back. For example, you could just get a CSV back either as a file, it could be get a zip of file return. You know, there's various things that can actually come back, but JSON tends to be the most common thing I've dealt with. So you'll likely be parsing that. So thus you'll generally have this data equals response uh, JSON. Uh, and from there, it just depends on what the JSON looks like. Again, if you're doing something more generalized, instead of doing uh, this hard coding section here that I have, uh, you'll likely put this either in a list or in some sort of config file where you have a list of all the APIs you're dealing with, but I just called it out explicitly here so that it can pull out um, all of that data. So you're parsing that information and eventually you're gonna wanna push it uh, somewhere, but we're not gonna do that here today. We're just talking about extracts and working with APIs. But we've talked a lot about kind of the initial stuff. Now there's a few other things that are important to deal with. Again, pagination and authentication that are really critical and can honestly just take on what feels like an infinite amount of combinations. So we're going to talk about a few of those methods uh, and the challenges you might face while dealing with them uh, before really digging into just things I've dealt with personally. So now that we've kind of gone through some of the code, let's talk about some of the different ways you're going to deal with authentication. You obviously do not want to often share your API or your data uh, publicly, right? Because the API will often act as a layer between the out side world and your internal database. You don't want everyone having access to it, so there are various ways we kind of keep that information secure. Probably the most common way most people know are API keys. It's generally pretty simple to implement, but is viewed as insecure. We can do basic authentication, which is another option that you have. Basic authentication is really just you having a username and a password, encoding that string before pushing it over and getting the information back. Uh, the reason obviously it's insecure is because if that password is leaked, uh, it's immediately now exposing all the data that that user has access to, which is why in some cases, whitelisting can be another method that you use to set up your API and keep it secure, where your API expects and only allows certain calls or maybe certain users to access data based on their IP address. So, right, like if you know whitelisting, you know, it just basically means, hey, these are the only IP addresses that can access this API or database, and that can also be added into your API a setup. I know because I've had this problem where I, I've i never, I've actually rarely run into this, but I had a client where they had uh, someone else uh, with their API externally, and they gave me the information like, hey, here's the information we're using. Uh, and I pinged it a few times and realized, oh, I'm not getting access, even though they are getting access. Um, so we need to go to um, the company and figure out what's wrong. And it was because there was also a whitelist process that no one in my client uh, actually was aware of uh, needs to actually happen. Then there also is uh, OAuth, which you're likely familiar with if you've ever signed in via a different system like Google or Facebook, and you've essentially given this other application access uh, through that, maybe even given them access to data. And if you really want uh, to dig deeper in that one in particular, Byte Byte Go has a great uh, both article and video on this. So you can go uh, look and we'll put up the image from there. But if you want to learn more, uh, check it out after this video. It can be the most painful to work with uh, if you're not using some sort of online application and you're trying to do it via code, but it is one of those many options that you have that basically has an access token set up as you're kind of going through the process and you give that um, authorization, uh, eventually an access token is created and then that access token is uh, tracked throughout the process. And there's a few other ways uh, that you might be securing your API. I don't see these as often. Uh, you might see something like uh, client certificates, um, also things like SAML or a security assertion markup language um, methods used or finally just uh, JSON web token. But those are just some ways I've seen people secure their API. I'm sure there's probably some I've missed, but you're probably already starting to see where it might be difficult to create a single generalized API connector, but let's dive into pagination. So when you make a request to get data from an API, you might only get a hundred rows of data back, essentially rows but you also might need to get 100,000 or a million rows. And let's be clear, that is a lot of data that is not going to successfully come over the internet, or at least most likely it won't. So 
Generally, these data sets get broken up, and that's where pagination comes in. Basically, uh, pagination is the process of dividing uh, a large set of data into smaller, more manageable chunks of data, or often called pages, and this can take many forms, or at least this can be denoted in many forms. So you might know of kind of the offset version, where basically you're saying, hey, in the first call, you probably say the offset zero, or maybe don't even reference offset as one of the parameters and you give it let's say a limit of 100 in the next one you know you have to now offset it by 100 so it starts at the next most recent row this is assuming that that data comes in order uh, there's a few times where i've run into issues where maybe the api for some reason doesn't keep track of what you've returned but assuming that all the data comes in a specific order and assuming that no new data is added um, as you're kind of going through uh, this is one of the methods it's it's honestly not my favorite method because you have to keep track of where things are and that just gets a little messy. Again, if new data is added in, you have to make sure you're only pulling from the oldest data first and kind of going forward so that you get the newest data and you don't accidentally drop uh, data as you're going through. My favorite method of pagination tends to be hypermedia pagination, and I honestly didn't actually know what it was called. Uh, I just know I like this approach where I often get the next uh, URL in my API response. So when you get the API data back, there's usually something that's either like next or some similar kind of term that it suggests that there's a next page and you just have to take that URL and, and plop it in and say, as long as there's, you know, when you write your loop, you can just say, and you're trying to parse this data, you can say, as long as there's still data as I'm running this loop on my API, and as long as it's not blank in this in this value or this field, keep running uh, your scraper or keep running my extract. So that's why I like it. I don't have to sit there and figure out, okay, what number I'm at, you know, how much do I have to offset by? Obviously it's not complex to do that via code, but I know what the next one is and I just don't have to think about it. So personally, it's just my favorite. Similarly, there's page-based uh, pagination, which is, as it suggests, just you saying, okay, we got the first page and generally the limit is either hard-coded or maybe it's part of this process is you're telling it how big to make these pages and you just tell, okay, we went to page one, now increment to page two, now increment to page three, et cetera, and keep going through. Um, finally, there's cursor-based pagination and honestly for both page-based and cursor-based, I've seen on top of this essentially hypermedia pagination. So if there's a cursor, maybe in the next field, you'll be able to actually grab it and go or then same thing with just page based. And cursor is just basically there's a cursor that's keeping track of where you are. And again, that's why you kind of need it generally with the hypermedia component because you don't know what the cursor is. They probably do. And you have to kind of use that uh, to track as you're kind of going through it. It tells you what page to go next. So let's quickly talk about some of the challenges you're going to run into when extracting data from an API. Uh, one of them is an API, uh, or these APIs might not tell you that they have a limit in terms of maybe they only return 10,000 rows of data and that's it. And once you hit the max, they just won't tell you. They'll just return all the data. And then you have to figure out how to actually interact with or talk to someone um, on their team to say, hey, I need more than 10,000 rows. How am I going to do that? Uh, your documentation doesn't say anything because usually that's another issue is like maybe there's a way to use pagination but the documentation doesn't cover it because they assumed very few people will get there um, another issue i've run into is kind of this nested api call where i remember this happening with one specific api where i think i have to call in order to get like task information i had to call first projects then kind of uh, the sections uh, of those projects or like basically if you can think of a kanban board those various kind of different flow lanes and then i could get to tasks so i literally had to get a list of all the projects and that was one api call then had to go individually by project and be like okay now for this project give me all the the sections and now for this section give me all the tasks so it was just this exploding kind of thing where i think this api was built a little more for software engineers so hey if you want to interact with our api to um, integrate your system great if you want to do a giant data pull this is not what this is built for, but we needed the data, so that's what we did. So it tends to just be built for more software integrations, and that can be a little bit of a problem. And still, other APIs have a whole host of problems, which is why I think some people like to use out-of-the-box uh, data connectors, because APIs change all the time. In fact, I had a customer ask me that recently as I was going through their API um, that they need to pull from, and I saw that about every six months, changes were occurring. Sometimes that meant rows being removed, sometimes that meant things being added, sometimes it meant complete deletion of certain API endpoints. So there is some chance that these APIs will change. And so that's another challenge you face. And that's why some people like um, out of the box connectors, but truthfully, even with the 1500 plus connectors that Portable has, there are still some that I see that they don't have. I just recently had to build one because of this. And so you need to know how to build an API uh, extract layer, which hopefully this video gives you a good understanding of the various ways it can happen. Again, 
I could go through a deep dive example of one, but there's honestly just what feels like dozens of ways you are going to come across um, various APIs. So hopefully this helps you understand how to interact with them, how that the fact that there are different methods of authentication, you shouldn't assume they're all going to act the same because they won't. And everyone has their least favorite API to work with. With that, guys, I hope this video was helpful in you understanding how you're going to have to interact with APIs. We're also going to talk about databases, um, SFTP, and a couple other sources before going into things like transform and loading data. But with that, guys, I hope this was helpful and I'll see you all in the next one. Thanks all. Goodbye.